If you have your copy of Scripture, we're going to be in three different locations in Scripture today. So if you'll first turn to Mark chapter 15, if you'll put a place in John chapter 19, and a place in Luke 23. Mark 15, John 19, Luke 23. Last week, we introduced the last words of Jesus, the seven sayings from the cross, and we took three of those, and we're going to look at the last four today. I'm really excited about being able to kind of unpack these things. It's been a, a great study for me to kind of look at the words of Jesus. I, I don't think often, and I, I wish that we did more. Maybe you do. I don't know. I, I, I don't think often that we, when Jesus speaks things, that we really think that he's speaking to us. That we take his words and say, okay, he's talking to me and he wants me to understand something. Well, today I, I want you to see that Jesus is talking to you and he does have something that he wants you to hear and understand. You've probably heard these sayings before, but we're going to kind of work through these and, and think about what does it mean for us. And this is important because today's Palm Sunday. We are heading into Easter today. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus was riding on a donkey as he came into Jerusalem, and everyone was shouting and singing and praising God. And they were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were so excited. And then things turned really, really quickly. And what we're going to come to today is the last four sayings that Jesus said while he was on the cross. We talked about last week that these are important, not just because they're the last things he said, but it was because it took everything that he had to be able to say the things that he said. So we need to listen to them. We need to believe them. And we need to accept what Christ wants and wants to give us in these sayings. So the first one is Mark chapter 15, verses 34 through 36. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, behold, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put, a, put it on a reed and gave him a drink, saying, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. We left off last week with Jesus making sure that his mother was taken care of and putting her in the charge of John, his beloved disciple. And it's been a couple of hours since that's happened. And he cries out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, many of the phrases that we're going to hear today, Jesus is pulling directly from the Old Testament. And, and this one was clearly pulled from Psalm 22. In fact, uh, he's basically trying to say what I'm saying right now encompasses all of Psalm 22. I would encourage you to go home and read it. It's an amazing psalm. But Jesus, having been on the cross several hours, having been dealing with all the things that he dealt with, being beat half to death, being striped, being put on the cross, being you know, humiliated, mocked, and scorned, in the middle of all this, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You ever felt that way? You ever felt all alone? You ever felt like that your prayers don't go past the ceiling? You ever felt that exactly what Jesus said, God, you've forsaken me. Why aren't you here? Why aren't you doing the things that I need you to do? Why aren't you helping me? I want you to hear these words on the lips of God himself. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus says this because he was experiencing everything that we go through except for sin. One of the things the Bible tells us, and it's true, is that Jesus experienced everything that we as human beings experience except the experience of sinning against God. Committing a sin himself. And sometimes people like to say, well, you know, this isn't real. Jesus is God. He's man. I mean, you know, what could he have been feeling at this point? I don't know. Let's think about what he could be feeling. At this moment, God is laying on him all of our sin. Jesus didn't sin, but he felt the weight and the consequences of our sin. 
See, here's the thing. We never feel the weight and consequences of our sin. Yes, there are consequences to our sin that we have. Yes, there are, we, we experience those in our life. But Jesus experienced the weight and the full consequence of sin, which means he was forsaken by God. God turned his back on him, and he experienced death. Jesus experienced the full weight and consequences of our sin. Up until this point, there had never been a moment in history, the history of the universe, where God and Jesus had not been in complete and total communication and fellowship and harmony. But at this moment, that was broken. Why? It was broken because God laid on him our sin. Jesus understands better than we do what the weight of sin and the consequences of sin really are. He understands what it feels like to be forsaken by God. We don't understand that. We, we are born into sin. We are born as sinners and we sin all of our life and we have broken relationship with God all of our life and it doesn't, we don't really understand that difference, but he does. Can you imagine to be sinless, perfect, in perfect fellowship with God, in perfect relationship with God, in perfect love with God, in one moment, and then in another moment, you are tarred by the sin of all humanity. You are engulfed by the shame and by the, the filth and the dirt of our sin and have fellowship broken. Jesus experiences everything that we go through except for sin. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The forsaken feeling that Jesus had comes as a necessary consequence of sin. We are forsaken because that is the depth of brokenness that's caused by sin. It destroys our relationship to God. It breaks our fellowship with God. It, it, it keeps the love of God from flowing to us. It keeps us from knowing and understanding and feeling how God feels about us and what he thinks about us. And so Jesus experiences that. Now I want you to think about this for just a second. How awful it would be to experience that for one person, but if Jesus experiences that feeling for every person who has ever lived or ever will live. Can you think about that just a second? Jesus experiences feeling forsaken by God for every person. Jesus experiences the weight and the consequences of every person's sin. I can't even, I can't even understand what that would feel like or, or I can't even understand the magnitude of that. So he cries out. People who were around him misunderstood what he was saying. They thought he was calling for Elijah. He wasn't calling for Elijah, he was calling for his father. But he was also reaching back. He was reaching back into the Old Testament to grab a promise that God had made many, many hundreds of years before this moment. Because he wanted people then and he wants people now to understand that what was happening was not an accident. What was happening was not a coincidence. What is happening is, is a fulfillment of God's promise. I told you to go back and read Psalm 22 and I would encourage you to do it. Psalm 22 was written 800 years before crucifixion ever existed. And you say, well, why does that matter? Because in Psalm 22, David, writing about his relationship with God, begins to explain what crucifixion really looks like. He talks about being crucified. He talks about being rejected. He talks about all these kind of things. But David could not know, and the people could not know, and we could not see, but Jesus did. Jesus reaches back into Psalm 22 and says, when God talked about that then, this is what he's talking about now. You say, but Michael, come on. 
Let me just tell you some things that Psalm 22 talks about. Psalm 22 has a section where it says that God's person would come and he would be rejected by the people. He'd be despised. He'd be humiliated. He'd be outcast. Now I can see you're not convinced yet. I have more ammo. It says God's anointed one would have his hands and feet pierced. Now again, 800 years before there was a, an execution called crucifixion, and it said that they would take me and they would pierce my hands and they would pierce my feet. Pretty powerful. Right after they pierced his hands and his feet, it said that people would, would gamble. They would cast lots to divide his garments. And I think we talked about that last week, right? Right after Jesus' hands and feet were pierced, the Roman soldiers right at the feet of Jesus gambled for his last possessions. That's in there. He said, not one of my bones would be broken. Very common in the crucifixion practice because it took a really long time to die. Um, if they wanted to get rid of you really quickly, they would come out and they would take a huge sledgehammer and they would break your legs. They'd smash your knees, they'd smash your femur, they'd smash all the way down where you couldn't push up and get a breath. And in fact, they did that to the people around Jesus, but guess what, they didn't do it to Jesus. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before God would be on a cross, God said, this is going to happen. They're going to pierce my hands and feet. They're going to gamble for my clothes. Not one of my bones would be broken. And that's what he's saying. He reaches back. He reaches back to communicate that God keeps his promises. And the ending of that psalm is glorious because the ending of the psalm says this. God brings salvation to his people. That God redeems his people. And Jesus is trying to say that God forsakes me so that he doesn't have to forsake you. I have God turn his back on me so that God never turns his back on you. I have God pour out his wrath and justice and anger against sin, your sin, on me so that he doesn't have to pour it out on you. I taste death for you so that you don't have to taste death. God brings salvation. So Jesus reaches back to grab hold of this promise, to pull it in, to say, I want you to see right now what is happening. God's promise is being fulfilled in front of your eyes. I want you to make no mistake about who I am. I want you to make no mistake about what is happening here. They're not just killing an innocent person, and they are. They're not just crucifying God, and they are. What's happening here is salvation. Now, before we knew, move to his next saying, one of the things I want to spend just a moment on that you need to hear. No one knows better what you are going through than Jesus. For so many of us, we don't come to Jesus. We don't talk to Jesus. We don't pray to Jesus. We don't bring our life to Jesus because we think he doesn't understand. We've pushed him at arm's length because he's God, and he is. He is God. But we keep him at arm's length because we think he can't ever understand what I'm going through. And the reality is God became a man to experience everything that we experience except committing sin. And so here's the thing you need to hear today. Whatever you're going through, no one understands that better than Jesus. You ever been picked on? He has. You ever been left out? He has. You have a dysfunctional family? Guess what? He does. He, he, he understands that. Even if you say we put the fun in dysfunction. You ever felt alone? He has. No one understands 
what you're going through better than Jesus. Turn to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verses 28 and 30. As the day war wears on and he has carried our sin, it says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Now, I know you may think that in the seven sayings that this one probably doesn't have a place there because it's like, well, no, duh, he's thirsty. But again, he's reaching back into the Old Testament to fulfill, and it even says this right here, knowing that all things are accomplished according to the scriptures. In Psalm 22, verse 15, and Psalm 69, 21, we are told that the Messiah would suffer and that same Psalm, Psalm 22 that I told you about, there was another section where the person who is suffering, the person who is experiencing this crucifixion says that my mouth is so dry that my tongue is stuck to the roof of my mouth. I can't say anything. Psalm 69 tells us that the Messiah would struggle because people would, would try to tempt him with wine and tempt him with sour drink, and they did that. Earlier on in the day in the crucifixion, the soldiers came to him and they, you know, brought him this really nasty sponge to put in his mouth. And, and then right as he was about to take it, they pulled it back from him. They said, here, Jesus, let us show you some compassion. Let us help you out. We know you're thirsty. Here, take this. And as he leans down to take it, they're like, ha ha, gotcha. Psalm 69 said that he would be mocked. They would withhold him drink. And when they finally would give it to him, it was gall mixed with vinegar. It was this terrible tasting, terrible smelling wine. And that's exactly what he gets. He says, I'm thirsty. One of the great things that we understand about Jesus' death when he says this accomplishes all the promises, all the prophecies according to Scripture, do you recognize that there are over 20 prophecies that get fulfilled in less than 24 hours when Jesus dies? 20 Old Testament prophecies about when, how, where, and the method of crucifixion, about slapping him in the face, about the crown of thorns, about gambling for his clothes. 20 prophecies fulfilled in less than 24 hours. He says, I'm thirsty. That thirst that he is feeling indicates the horrific toll that this took on him. I mean, he pretty much lost all of the blood that he had. They beat him with a cat of nine tails. His back was completely open. He'd lost all this blood. Now he's been hanging on the cross and doing chin-ups all day trying to get a breath. He's spent. He's wrung out. See, I, th I think sometimes we forget that, yes, forgiveness of sins is free. It is free. It's free to us, but it costs Jesus everything. He was completely wrung out. He was completely wrung out, and he needed something. He needed to wet his lips and to wet his mouth because he still had something important to say. I'm glad they included this, I am thirsty, that fulfills the scriptures, yes, but it also prepares us because what happens next is the word, it's a word, it's three words in our Bible, but it's one word that changes everything. Verse 29, a jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. <clears throat> and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In other accounts of the crucifixion, it doesn't just say that he said it. It says that he shouted it that he cried out in a loud voice. 
Jesus says, I'm thirsty. And they fill his mouth with enough sustenance to, to, to wet his lips and to wet his tongue and to open up his mouth. And, and Jesus does another chin up again to pull himself up. And he screams, it is finished. The one word in Greek is tetelesai. It's three words in English. Jesus had something very important to say. And here's what he means when he says it is finished. All my work is done. All throughout Jesus' ministry, he'd been saying, my work is not done, my work is not done, my work is not done, my work is not done. And yet in this moment, he says, my work is done. And the resurrection hadn't even happened yet. Now here's the reality. The resurrection is the cherry on top. It's the proof that what his work did accomplished what he came to do. And what did he come to do? He came to seek and to save those who are lost. And in that moment, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, it is finished. I've accomplished my work. When he says it is finished, what he is saying is that sin, death, hell, and the devil have finally been defeated. It's a victory cry. Now I know everybody around him and many today look at that cry and say it is finished. And then he dies and they say, oh yeah, it's finished. He's done. He's over. It's it. No, Jesus is claiming victory in that moment. Sin has been defeated. Death has been defeated. Hell has been defeated. The devil has been defeated. They are done. It's Jesus's victory cry. But it's also our hope. When he says it is finished, he's telling us that forgiveness is now available through his blood. Here's what he's saying to all of us. You no longer have to carry your sin. You no longer have to use faulty sacrifices that never take away your sin. They just kind of cover it. You don't have to live in shame anymore. You don't have to live with guilt anymore. You don't have to live as a slave to sin anymore. Forgiveness is available. Forgiveness has been given as a gift. It's finished. Even more, let me tell you what it means. This is what it means to me personally. It means I can stop trying to pay off my sin. I can stop trying to work off my sin. I can stop trying to be good enough. I can stop trying to work hard enough. I can stop being passionate and all the things that we think we need to do to deal with our sin because it is finished. Jesus took every drop of my sin and covered it in his blood. He crucified it in the cross and he buried it in his grave and he walked out alive on Easter Sunday morning. It is finished. There is nothing left for me to pay. And that's not just for me, that's for you too. Jesus has taken every drop of your sin every drop of your shame, every drop of your guilt, every drop of your habit, every drop of your lifestyle, crucified it to the cross, buried it in the grave, never to be seen again. It's finished. So why, so why do we run around all the time trying to prove to God and everybody else that we can pay for our sin? because we don't listen to what he says. It is finished. Luke chapter 23. After Jesus cries out, 
It is finished. And before he dies, he says one last thing. Luke 23, verse 46. And Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God saying, certainly this man was innocent. Another account, we have another one that's saying, truly he must be the son of God. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus again reaches back into the Old Testament, reaches back into the Psalms, pulls a promise from the Old Testament to the cross. Jesus is quoting Psalm 31 verses one through five. David is talking about a disastrous time in his life. And, you know, I love David because when I read the Psalms, I feel so much like him. I don't know about you, but you ever read the Psalms? Like in the Psalms, David is happy, sad, confused, angry, uh, you know, all in one Psalm. And I'm like, I get that. In this Psalm, David is tore up because everything's going wrong and everybody hates him and everybody wants to kill him. And he starts talking about God. God, you're my rock. You're my fortress. You're my solid ground. And as he's listing all these things that God is in the middle of that, he says, I commit my spirit to you. Now, this isn't gonna seem groundbreaking. Hang with me. Jesus feels safe in trusting his life into God's hand. Not a shocker, right? Not a shocker that he feels safe in trusting his life into God's hands. Here's the thing we need to see. Even in his moment of death, he gives himself to God. And the the reason that Jesus felt safe doing this is because that's what he had done with all of his life. Father, not my will be done, but your will be done. Father, I'm only gonna say the things that you want me to say. I'm only gonna do the things that you want me to do. I'm only gonna live how you want me to live. And, and, And here's the great, he was God. I mean, Jesus literally could have done what he wanted to do because he was God, but instead he said, no, I I wanna do what you want me to do. And so the habit of Jesus's life is that he had been entrusting himself to God his entire life. And it only seems strange to us because we say we entrust our life to God when in reality we say, okay, God, you can have this, but you can't have that. You can have this, but you can't have that. I'm gonna keep that. I'm gonna work on it myself. Even in his moment of death, he gives himself to God. This is a struggle for us. I mean, let's just be honest. I'll be honest. It's a struggle for me. It's a struggle for me all the time to entrust my life to God. I don't know that I, being in Jesus' situation, would say the same things that he said. I definitely would be calling people to my aid to destroy all the people who are hurting me. I think I would be doing that. I don't think I would be saying, Father, forgive them. I would be saying, bring, you know, fire down out of heaven. I definitely don't be thinking like, okay, God, I'm gonna entrust my life to you. Whatever happens, happen. I'd be saying, get me out of here. And the reason I can say that is because that's what I do right now. Get me out of this. It's too tough. It's too much. I don't deserve this. But Jesus committed his life to God. Why? Well, he knows some things about God that we sometimes forget. I would encourage you to go home and read Psalm 31 verses one through five because it tells you just a litany of things of who God is. The first thing that you find out is God is our refuge. We love to put that in songs and crochet it on pillows, but we really don't think about what it means. Refuge is a military term. Stronghold. It's the place that we go when we're in trouble. It's the place that we go when we've exhausted our resources. The places that we go that we know at least here, I'll be safe. He said, God is our refuge. He's the stronghold of our life. 
I love when I think about refuge or I think about stronghold, I think about the movie, The Lord of the Rings. If you guys watch this, you watch it, you'll know what I'm talking about as soon as I say it. The evil army was flooding over the earth and the humans had to find a place to go. And they go to Helm's Deep. Helm's Deep was a stronghold built into the rocks of a mountain. I mean, basically when you show up to this place, it's just all rock. And they get to hide inside the mountain and, and they go there because they know nobody can get in. Nobody can break in. And so that's where they went. That's who God is for us. God is that shelter. God is that rock. God is that fortress that we can hide ourselves in and be protected. It also calls him our rock and our fortress. One of the things that we need to remember is God cannot be overcome by our enemies. Unfortunately, in the movie, The Lord of the Rings, they went to their place, they went to their fortress thinking they were safe, but they didn't realize that their fortress had a weakness. And their enemy found the weakness in their fortress and exploited it. And it was awful. But as I stand here today on the authority of God's word, can I tell you this? Our fortress has no weaknesses. No weapon formed against our God can prosper. There's no enemy strong enough. There's no enemy big enough. In fact, when we read in the end in Revelation, when the armies of the earth, literally crawling over the face of the earth, millions and millions and millions of people come against Christ, Christ shows up by himself and he comes riding in on a white horse. He doesn't have a sword. He doesn't have cannons. He doesn't have attack helicopters. He comes in and he speaks a word and they all fall. That's who he is. Jesus commits his life into God's hands because he knows that God's hands are the safest place for you to be. Because God is our rock. God is our fortress. God is our refuge. He's willing to commit his hands into God or committing his life into God's hands because he knows that God will lead him and guide him and God will lead me and guide us. Psalm 31 tells that God leads us and guides us. God knows the way that we need to go. Now I'm sure that none of us would wanna pick the road that Jesus walked on, but God did. God walked him down that road. And I love sharing this at funerals because it's the most important thing. God knows where we need to go and God knows how we need to get there and God is leading us and guiding us along the way. And here's what you need to hear that even in the valley of the shadow of death, you can fear no evil for God is with you. And here's the thing you need to hold on to. God will never ask you to walk through death alone. There was someone that walked through death alone so that you don't have to. Jesus walked through the valley of the shadow of death by himself. He took the weight of our sin. He took the weight of our judgment. He took the weight of all of that. And he died and he drank down death completely. And he walked out on the other side alive. So that now when we start to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, someone comes alongside of us and grabs our hand and leads us from life to real life and death never touches us. God will lead us, God will guide us and you will never walk alone. He says, God will deliver me and God will rescue me in Psalm 31. Now here's the thing that didn't happen for Jesus that happens for us. When Jesus pulls this from the Old Testament in Psalm 31, here's what he's saying. God doesn't deliver me so I can deliver you. God doesn't rescue me so I can rescue you. You need to see what's happening today. This is God's deliverance and God's rescue. What I'm doing for you is how God delivers you. And I love in the midst of that, he talks about 
God delivering and rescuing. And one of the things he says as God delivers us, he'll never let us be put to shame. Think about that. Jesus was shamed so that we are not put to shame. Now, I know that we feel shame at times, and a lot of that times is we're feeling shame because we haven't come and asked for forgiveness and offered it to Jesus. But here's the reality. God will never let us be put to shame. What that means is we'll never be separated from him. God wipes away our shame. God wipes away our guilt with his grace and forgiveness. Psalm 31 verses one through five ends with God will redeem me. He'll deliver, he'll rescue, he'll save, and he'll redeem. Redemption means buying back. Most commonly it was used for buying someone out of slavery. And Jesus reaches back into the Old Testament for this promise and he brings it forward and says, this is being fulfilled right now. What I'm doing is buying you back. I'm redeeming you from your slavery to sin and I'm setting you free. God will redeem us. God is always ready and God is always willing to save you. The question that you need to think about today is do you believe the words that Jesus has spoken? Is he telling you the truth? Is that his heart? Is he lying to you? I'm, I'm hard pressed to think that Jesus is lying as he's dying. I'm hard pressed to think that as he's pulling up to get a last breath, to kind of gasp some air into his lungs to say something, that that would be the moment he would choose to lie. So here's the question. Are you willing, are you willing to commit your life into the hands of God today? What does that look like? For some of us, coming for the first time to say, I'm a sinner. And Jesus, I recognize that only what you did on the cross will save me. I commit my hands, I commit my life into your hands. I want you to save me. For some of us, it's dealing with the things in our life. We've asked Jesus to save us, but now we are torn up by unforgiveness. We're torn up by hurt feelings. We're torn up by broken relationships. We're torn up by habits and, and lifestyles. We're torn up by things that we've said and things that we've done or things that we should have said and didn't say and things that we should have done, didn't do. And so we just carry around all this mess all the time. I commit my life into your hands. I'm willing to let go of these things for you to give me life. Maybe it's taking that next step of faith. I'm ready to be baptized. I'm ready to join the church. I'm ready to give my life in service. You heard some of our kids did that this weekend. That they came to a place and said, Jesus, I'm ready. I'm ready to commit my life into your hands. Are you? Let's pray. Father, help us. Help us today to commit ourselves to you, to turn our life over to you. Help us to let go of our sin, to let go of our hurt, to let go of our pain, to let go of our pride, to let go of our fear and give ourselves to you. Father, we, we ask as you are speaking to us that you would give us the grace to say yes. Thank you in advance for how you're gonna move in our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Hey, my name is Gabby Betancourt. Thank you so much for joining us on our live stream today. If you have any questions about what we have going on here at Central, please make sure to check out our website. We have everything listed on there. And if you feel led to make a decision based on what you heard today, please make sure to message us. We would love to connect with you.